Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you, Future Zags, for joining us today. I'm Erin Hayes, Director of Admission, and I'm thrilled so many of you are able to attend today's special event. Um, before I introduce the president, let me provide some process information about this webinar. First, this program is going to be recorded. It will be posted on the website and sent out via email to all admitted and enrolling students, including you. Um, second, I have a few colleagues in the webinar to help field questions, and you might see their names on the screen right now. Um, we ask that you please post questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat, and then we will keep track of the questions as they come through. Now let me introduce you to Dr. Thane McCullough, president of Gonzaga University. Dr. McCullough was born in Los Angeles and grew up in the Seattle area where he attended Seattle's Bishop Blanchett High School. Following high school, he enlisted as a food service specialist in the U.S. Army. A fellow Zag, he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1989 with a major in psychology and a minor in sociology. As a student, he served as resident assistant and resident director, was active in university ministry, was chapter president of Alpha Sigma Nu, the Jesuit Honor Society, and was elected student body president his senior year. From here, he went to England for graduate school and ultimately received his PhD in experimental psychology from Oxford University. He began his career at Gonzaga University in 1990 and has served in numerous capacities, the last 10 of which have been as our president. So I now present to you Gonzaga's president, Dr. Thane McCullough. Thank you very much, Erin, and uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us uh, for this um, opportunity. We're, we're super excited to have the opportunity to connect with you today and uh, to uh, both uh, represent a little bit about Gonzaga University from my perspective, as well as to uh, open up an opportunity for questions and answers. And before uh, I do anything else, I just want to take an opportunity uh, to acknowledge something that I'm sure all of you uh, have heard now many, many times, but it is, it is a very real uh, um, matter for all of us that we're, we're all dealing with and we're all wrestling with. But for those of you um, who are in the final uh, stages of completing your high school uh, careers, I, I just want you to know how proud we are of you, uh, how much we recognize just how um, strange this whole uh, senior year has turned out to be for you. Um, and to let you know that we're very conscious of that uh, and mindful of it. Um, but but we, we also hope that um, you know that um, we're just extraordinarily excited about the possibility that uh, you're looking at Gonzaga and you're thinking about uh, the next stage uh, of your own educational journey uh, with us in mind, uh, because here at GU, uh, in our own way, uh, we too um, have been uh, journeying on, along this same path, and we're very conscious for our own graduating seniors uh, this spring how difficult um, it's been to uh, be dispersed and to try to do all this stuff from home and and to not be able uh, to be with one another in the same ways that we that we're so used to and are so much a part of our cultural tradition. So that, that having all been said, uh, graduating from high school uh, is an, a really truly important accomplishment. Uh, there, there are still large numbers of students who uh, not only do not ever uh, move on to the collegiate level, they, they actually don't graduate from high school. Uh, so it's an achievement uh, and for those of you uh, who have been admitted to Gonzaga University, uh, you have uh, done extraordinarily well, and we know you have many options that you could choose from. Uh, so we're particularly uh, excited that you have uh, decided to look at us and to think about um, joining this community in the fall. Um, Aaron did a great job of, of providing a little introduction on who I am. I would just share with you that uh, embedded within that story uh, is uh, an, an individual who really honestly struggled uh, quite a bit in high school. And um, 
I found myself departing the high school uh, period of my life, uh, really kind of wondering, you know, where where I next would go and what I next would do. Uh, and uh, while my journey did take me to the military, which was actually a really important part of my own personal journey, it led me eventually to Gonzaga University. Uh, and that truly was a transformational uh, period in my life. I imagined all kinds of different things that I might do uh, having uh, taken advantage of a college education. Uh, but the ways in which I experienced this community, never knowing at that time that I would be given the opportunity someday in the future to come back uh, and to be a part of this university and ultimately to have this position uh, was truly something that um, really impacted me uh, in, in ways that I can't even really um, adequately articulate. Uh, this is a strong, powerful uh, community of people who are committed first and foremost to uh, its students. And uh, I often say out of my own experience, but then out of nearly 30 years of working at this institution and working across that time with great colleagues, uh, fabulous faculty and, and uh, members of our staff, but many, many students too, uh, that this is a university uh, that is in large part uh, created by uh, its students, by the students who come here. Uh, you, you as, as a student at Gonzaga would become part of the driving force that really creates the experience of who we are. And in some ways that came through very powerfully during the last few weeks of, of our spring semester, even though our students were scattered in many cases um, back home and all over the country, in some cases, even internationally, uh, they formed a powerful bond of community. And uh, that really um, carried us all through and helped us to bring uh, our semester to a successful conclusion. So uh, what I hope you would uh, find uh, as you uh, may have had the opportunity in, in early visits to the campus uh, is a, a community that's really focused on the success of each and every one of its students and uh, does that work in, an, uh, in a way that attempts to really from the very beginning um, understand, recognize, identify that each one of the members of our community comes with their own powerful story, uh, years of commitment to education, uh, dedication to service uh, in their own communities. Uh, many, many of our students have been in and served uh, their communities in leadership pos uh, positions. Uh, many of, of our students are artists and musicians. And so uh, it's a tremendously talented community of people. Uh, and when we come together and we have opportunities uh, to work together, uh, as is consistently the lived experience uh, of students at GU, um, amazing things happen. And the proof of that really comes in what our, what our graduates end up doing after their time at Gonzaga, but even all along the way. Uh, Spokane, a community of roughly half a million people, really depends upon the students and the employees, our faculty and staff of this university, uh, even to animate um, and vibrantly support uh, the work of our community uh, more broadly. Our students are involved in so many different uh, activities and endeavors while they're here. Uh, and it both benefits the community uh, and especially because we, as an educational institution, are very connected with our K through 12 partners, many of the young people in our community, not exclusively, but many of them come to know Gonzaga through the experience of meeting GU students. But through that experience too, our students have opportunities to continue to grow in the development of their talents and their skills and their abilities as servant leaders, 
uh, and as uh, very creative problem solvers. Um, and that is a, um, a force within this broader region uh, that we're very proud of, uh, but again, is completely dependent upon students who wanna play an active role in making a difference. Uh, and that really is our mission. Uh, our mission is to uh, do our very best work uh, in providing and creating the context within which talented people uh, can continue to uh, develop and expand their own capabilities, ultimately uh, to become leaders and people who are serving uh, others in the various professions, uh, not only nationally, but internationally. Uh, and so all of our efforts are geared uh, towards that objective and at Gonzaga, I think our students would, would testify to the fact uh, that their lived experiences that uh, fundamentally we are here for them and with them and to support their own goals and their own aspirations uh, for the future. Um, so uh, there are lots of things as a university president, as you can imagine, that I could say and that I could talk about. Um, and uh, particularly in this kind of a venue, uh, where you might be able to see me, but I can't see all of you, uh, it would be tempting uh, to talk about all kinds of things that um, might not be, uh, they might be very interesting to me, but they might not be so interesting to you. But do, what I do want to talk about, though, uh, is, is the, the ways in which Gonzaga um, really thinks about itself in relationship um, to the world. Uh, and the ways in which we hope then that that animates uh, in a very vibrant way the lived experience of our students uh, and, and the, the colleagues with whom uh, they are working at, at the institution. Um, really, it's important uh, for me to tell you that as we think about uh, the way that the university has, has kind of developed over a period of time, I think about it in terms of chapters of a story. And that story has been developed uh, as a story of the university in relationship to the problems and the challenges that society faces. So if you go back in time to earlier days uh, in the university's history, uh, and you look at the development of, for example, our great programs in engineering, uh, you would find that the major programs in engineering were all developed and designed in direct response to the contemporary needs uh, that were expressing themselves at that time in society. So our School of Engineering uh, is nearing uh, a, a, a really a century of existence. It's in its 90th uh, year, and it's really had uh, an opportunity to uh, work with and educate a tremendous number of very, very talented people who have gone into many different uh, specialties and professions and advanced studies. Uh, but our School of Engineering um, has really played a significant role in the Northwest, for example, at training engineers who have gone into aerospace and who have done a tremendous amount of work on the major infrastructure projects of the 20th century in our region and, and across the, the West. So uh, when you think about the development of the university, its evolution over time, uh, you can think about it in terms of, of kind of a, 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 a response to the call of where society is moving and the kinds of practical challenges that it's trying to respond to. And so I, I mention engineering in particular at this time because we are seeing a, a growth in demand um, out of new areas uh, that are particularly dependent upon uh, the specialty and the expertise uh, that um, those who are trained in uh, fields like engineering can provide. Uh, but also uh, we're finding that the complexities of the challenges that the professions are offering now um, no longer neatly line up uh, in one particular uh, field or another. Indeed, uh, all of the work that's going on, for example, uh, in advanced robotics related to medicine uh, is dependent upon interdisciplinary relationships 
and the development of interdisciplinary uh, fields and expertise uh, and skill sets. So for that reason, we currently have our, our newest physical facility project uh, is a, uh, an integrated and interdisciplinary sciences and engineering facility. And that facility is currently under construction on our campus. Uh, it, it is going to be uh, under construction uh, really over the, the course of the next year. Uh, we have uh, been able to uh, underscore the importance of this facility even during the, the context of this pandemic such that construction has been able to continue on this facility has been recognized by the state uh, as a critical project uh, here in Spokane. Uh, and so we are still on track to be able to uh, open that facility for the fall of 2021, uh, which would obviously be after the first year of this next year, uh, but is going to be a spectacular addition to the already existing four facilities uh, that we have on the campus that are dedicated to science, engineering, and the related disciplines that support uh, our, our engineering and science programs. Why, in part, we're developing that new facility is because there are emergent new specialties that we realize require dedicated and committed facility space to enable our students and our faculty to both uh, be educated and educating uh, in an environment uh, that is contemporary and cutting edge, but also we need to create and expand uh, space to be able to develop uh, new programs uh, that, were, that are going to be uh, more capable of meeting some of the challenges uh, that we see emerging uh, out of medicine, um, out of the um, hybrid areas of bioinformatics, uh, computer science, uh, engineering, uh, related to environmental studies and environmental science. And also uh, we're working together with those who are in, in the industry that are particularly committed to and exploring ways that material science uh, and in particular the focus on composites uh, can render themselves as available to uh, industry and we can train uh, students who are capable of working uh, in material science uh, to meet some of those uh, contemporary challenges. Engineering is just one of seven schools at the institution. Uh, and in turn, each of those schools is itself exploring and looking at the ways in which the professions that it prepares students for, and there are many, are calling to us as a university uh, to respond and to create the kinds of opportunities that are going to best prepare our graduates uh, to be able to both be creative and very well skilled uh, in, in that profession, regardless of what they choose. Gonzaga, for example, has a very powerful broadcast studies program, uh, which is uh, fully invested uh, with HTTV technology. Uh, we have had a tremendous amount of support uh, from colleagues uh, in uh, television broadcasting and in broadcasting more generally uh, because of a long, long history of preparing students out of the communication studies area uh, to do work in broadcast television. Uh, and they have helped us uh, to get state-of-the-art studio equipment so that our students know and understand how to work in that kind of technical environment, uh, preparing them very well to enter any number of different contemporary studio environments, uh, which provides our students with a competitive advantage relative to many broadcast programs that exist around the country. Um, that's just one of many examples, that one out of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Gonzaga University uh, has had a tremendous amount of interest over these last uh, few years in particular, growing interest in fields that serve health sciences in particular. Uh, and so we've seen tremendous growth uh, and development of programs uh, in nursing, 
uh, where there are uh, tremendous needs uh, in the health uh, uh, services sector uh, for talented and skilled health healthcare workers, particularly nurses, uh, to, um, to continue to support uh, the tremendous needs that exist within our country uh, with respect to health care uh, across the populations. Um, our commitment to health care, uh, our commitment to educating nurses, uh, and also to preparing pre-med and pre-dent students over a long, long period of time uh, was really at the core of an important initiative that I would want to share with you um, that we're very, very proud of. Uh, it has just been in the, in the latest part of its fourth year of existence. And that is a partnership uh, that we developed at the invitation of uh, Washington State's flagship state institution, the University of Washington, and specifically its School of Medicine. Um, the School of Medicine approached us a number of years ago about the possibility of developing uh, what is actually a quite unique partnership uh, between itself uh, and Gonzaga University to uh, educate medical students in the first 18 months of their training uh, here in Spokane. And so for the last four years, uh, the University of Washington uh, School of Medicine in Spokane has been uh, teaching doctors on the campus of Gonzaga University uh, at the rate of about 60 uh, medical students per cohort uh, per year. Uh, and uh, a number of those uh, medical students uh, have been admitted uh, to the University of Washington School of Medicine uh, from Gonzaga University, as you might expect. Although uh, at the outset, um, it was very important to us uh, to be clear uh, that our focus was really on ensuring that this partnership uh, was going to be viable uh, and was going to continue to um, really create the opportunities for more doctors to be educated uh, within the Northwest and on this side of the state of Washington. Um, it has proven to be a very popular program uh, and uh, part of the popularity of that program is wrapped up in the fact that uh, those students are very, very much a part uh, of the student population of the broader campus. Uh, and the medical students, uh, many of whom uh, also uh, come from Spokane and, and Eastern Washington, some of whom as graduates of Gonzaga, very familiar already with the campus, um, have really uh, made a point of um, working together with uh, fellow students uh, those at the undergraduate level, helping them to understand what's really involved with getting into and succeeding in medical school, uh, and um, also really becoming engaged uh, in our broader community efforts to um, help the, the Spokane community in many ways too. So we're very, very uh, excited about and proud of our association with the University of Washington because it really truly creates opportunity of many different kinds uh, for the students of Gonzaga uh, and for the people of Spokane. Uh, and uh, we really are also very grateful uh, because our faculty uh, who have long, long uh, been involved with the preparation of our students uh, for this kind of work um, have, have really embraced this opportunity. Um, and as a result, uh, it has, uh, in turn uh, created yet additional opportunities that are not directly related to the School of Medicine, but for example, um, have allowed us to create internships and partnerships uh, with the school, uh, with the University of Washington in terms of the biology department uh, and uh, experiences such as summer internships. Uh, so uh, our relationships with other institutions and in particular, uh, our colleagues at the University of Washington um, have allowed us to develop other kinds of expressions of opportunity that our students now uh, routinely take advantage of and allow them to um, develop lines of research uh, and scholarship 
that they then in turn um, can uh, utilize as they're applying to graduate programs, research opportunities, uh, or, or perhaps a professional program uh, that they themselves want to pursue. Um, so as an institution, uh, we have been very focused on ways that we can continue uh, to amp up and uh, broaden uh, the array of opportunities for all of our students across uh, the full array of programs uh, that the university offers uh, because it is our aspiration to continue uh, with each and every expression of our institution uh, to be the very best institution that we can be uh, and to uh, provide the very best uh, and most um, effective educational program that we can possibly offer. Um, one uh, example uh, where we have really um, been um, very pleased to be able to parlay this focus into opportunity for uh, many of our students has been uh, with the completion of a project that, that took a number of years, uh, but was uh, really has just been a tremendous uh, addition to our campus. And that is the uh, finalization uh, and the opening of the Myrtle Woldson Performing Arts Center for the, for the campus. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, it has allowed us to really underscore the importance of the performing arts as a significant dimension of a, a uh, well-rounded education. Uh, it's allowed us to really elevate uh, the the ability of our theater and dance and music programs uh, to create uh, experiences and opportunities for performance as well as practice uh, and development of skill. Um, and it has allowed Gonzaga to uh, become an active member in a new and more expressive way of the arts community of Spokane. So what I'm hoping with just a few of these examples is to relay to you a sense of how Gonzaga, uh, as it continues to think about the needs of its students and the ways that it can do its most effective work, uh, is ambitious uh, and somewhat uh, tireless in its pursuit of uh, continuously identifying and finding the next way that it can um, create greater opportunity uh, for all of the members uh, of its community, whether they be faculty, staff, or uh, particularly our students. Um, again, there are so many different um, ways in which we could talk about uh, the experience that we want to try and create uh, for all of you. Um, but I think what we'd want to do is to uh, turn it over and uh, reserve the remainder of the time to be able to answer the questions that you have, because we know that you've done your research uh, and that you're paying attention to the kinds of things that are on people's minds at this time. And uh, we want to try to do our best to answer as many of the questions as we can. Um, and uh, I'm sure that my colleagues uh, will facilitate an opportunity, should we run out of time, to nonetheless um, allow me to respond to the remaining questions and we can provide those to you after the uh, after the session. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Erin, and you can let me know what you're seeing. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, your opening remarks. Um, I think the big question of mind for people is really what are the plans for the fall? Um, with that, I think there's curiosity about um, how do you make those decisions? What's guiding you? And um, so maybe just starting there. Well, um, the, uh, the first thing I would want to say is this. Um, we are looking at everything that we're doing with respect to the fall with our eyes very wide open. Um, and we're paying very, very close attention, very careful attention uh, to what it is that uh, our regional health district, uh, our state, um, national guidance, uh, the, the best information that's coming forward from the medical community, uh, from our colleagues in the medical community, as well um, as you know, nationally recognized experts in the space. 
uh, have to tell us about what are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about um, and managing. And we have now for weeks been actively involved uh, in doing the work uh, to lay the ground for uh, very robust plans and the development of protocols uh, all in service to the goal of being able to resume operations, welcoming students back to campus uh, at the beginning of our defined fall semester uh, and uh, the ways in which we can do that uh, safely and the ways in which we can do that in a fully informed manner. Um, we believe that uh, based upon the feedback that we've received in part from our current students and from uh, families as well, uh, that we are obligated to do everything that we possibly can to try to see uh, if it is possible for us to uh, in fact achieve that objective. Uh, there is a huge uh, dimension of who we are as a university community uh, that is largely expressed uh, through the development of relationships. Uh, uh, and when it comes to the undergraduate experience, those relationships occur and are developed within the context of our physical campus community. Uh, we will, uh, I, I want to say, uh, in a sense, Gonzaga has never actually technically been closed uh, because we uh, certainly uh, at the point of our own spring break, which is in early March, uh, we're, we're um, clearly obligated uh, to uh, close down a lot of our on-campus operations to cease face-to-face -face instruction because the governor was enjoining every possible business uh, who could do so to do that. Uh, but even in the face of that, uh, we had a, a fairly significant number of students uh, who did not have places that they could return to safely uh, or um, who did not have uh, a location uh, that, that they were able to go, to go home to uh, and remained with us on campus in our residential facilities, supported by our food service uh, and our uh, university center operations. Uh, our health center and counseling center uh, remained active and available to those students. Uh, and throughout the course of the remaining uh, seven, eight weeks till the conclusion of our academic year, those students remained and in some cases remain with us now. So our, our university campus never fully uh, shut down. Uh, we felt a deep sense of obligation to those students uh, to continue to do everything we could to support them and to support their active education. Uh, and we feel that that was both the right decision, but it also allowed us an opportunity uh, to begin the work of preparing for what it might look like to reopen. Uh, so we have a large task force uh, that is currently meeting on a daily basis to develop a, a wide array of plans and protocols that we are, are developing in service to answering the question, how do we do this? effectively and safely. Uh, and we will uh, be communicating all along the way to our students about those plans and what obligations uh, this is going to um, really uh, incur for all of us. Because we see this as a uh, communal effort. Everybody who is going to be involved with participating in this work come fall is gonna to have to play an active role in helping us to um, help each other remain safe and well, uh, to uh, protect the, the needs of other people in this process and to work very closely together to actively manage uh, regardless of what eventuality emerges. So uh, it's a tremendously complex circumstance within which to do this work, uh, but again, we are not alone in this process. We feel like we have a lot of support uh, and we have a lot of expertise, uh, but we also have a lot of institutions around the country uh, that we're partnering with indirectly to try to gain uh, from and share with 
uh, to try to do this very effectively. So that's our goal. Our current plan is to uh, be back and operational and welcoming uh, students, both new and returning uh, for the fall semester. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions and some of them have a common theme. So I'm going to go to this one because it popped up a few times. There are some schools that announced they're going to start earlier and then finish um, right around Thanksgiving and, and then start winter break right after Thanksgiving and then come back in January. Um, yes. mm -hmm. Any thoughts around that with Gonzaga? So uh, I would just say without um, yet being able to make a, a decisive statement about this, that we are um, definitely seeing a lot of energy and support for uh, a concept related to that. Um, there's a lot of fear on the part of epidemiologists and, and then in turn people, you know, who are, who are trying to work these issues that, uh, you know, a campus community could uh, achieve a certain level of, of stasis with respect to um, you know, the transmission of illness. If, as people kind of come together, there's, there's sort of concern about management. And then as people settle in, uh, there's, a, there's a sense that, um, that things could achieve a fairly um, reasonable level of, of safety and comfort, but that at the point where people leave campus and go out and disperse into many different communities, it really significantly increases the chance that somebody will actually even unknowingly contract the virus and then bring it back to campus. And although, uh, you know, every university community functions a little bit differently and every student situation is a little different um, based upon, you know, what we generally understand about the virus, they might come back to campus and just about the time where everybody's trying to get into finals, we have uh, an emergent um, problem and a lot of people getting sick. So um, this question of whether or not to just sort of say, look, let's, let's call the conclusion of face-to-face -face instruction at the point where people leave for Thanksgiving is very much an active concept that we're considering at this point. Um, not so sure about starting a whole lot earlier, um, although there's a little bit of thought about whether or not we might want to expand a bit the move-in process, allow people a little bit more time uh, to come to campus than um, asking everybody to come on maybe one day. Um, but in terms of commencing instruction, I think our sense is that we'll probably continue to look at beginning on September 1, which is the formal declared start of the semester. If we find that uh, we're compelled to really carefully examine that issue of, of asking people not to return immediately after Thanksgiving, then um, that will in turn obligate us to think about um, how we make sure that the fullness of the semester, the objectives academically are satisfied. And there's a number of different ways that we can do that. But um, my sense is that we're gonna continue to examine that question at least for a little bit longer. And as soon as we make a determination, we'll let everybody know. Thank you. Um, quite a few questions about housing and um, you know, how might that look in creating distance? Is there going to be an increase in single rooms? You just touched on staggering move-in. There were some questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, so really wondering about plans for housing. Yeah, so um, housing is currently engaged in a whole process of examining scenarios. Um, one of the real challenges associated with uh, the evolution of this, of this virus um, has been the fact that uh, we had actually already made commitments to our returning students with respect to housing before we were ever at our own spring break um, and were compelled to make the decision to go ahead and um, cease face-to-face uh, -face instruction for the remainder of the spring. So a significant number of housing assignments, um, which for our returning students means um, that uh, a lot of them 
uh, choose to, to remain in the same space uh, and sometimes uh, choose to remain with the same roommate um, or make decisions about suite mates uh, in combination with one another because uh, they, they, they actually want to share space with a certain number of people, a certain set of people, um, had already uh, been kind of largely uh, administered before we got to the point of, of, of everything um, changing so drastically. So a, a, a little bit of the answer to the question comes down to what is the demand going to be uh, for the remaining spaces that we have. Uh, we had already determined, for example, that we were going to take a couple of residence halls offline. Um, that opens up opportunity for us to have a little bit more room to work with. Uh, but I think that it is um, probably best to say that uh, living within a residence hall uh, is fundamentally a communal living experience. Uh, and so uh, while there are certainly going to be, uh, I think, some limited options with respect to uh, opportunities for people to, to have their own rooms, um, there are, are going to be limited opportunities uh, at this point in our view because uh, the amount of space that we have to work with and the commitments that we've made, which our returning students do not appear to have uh, much self-elected interest in changing, um, is, is going to be part of what we have to evaluate. Now, we're, we're going to be very upfront uh, about what it is that we can or cannot do because we feel that we, we have an obligation uh, to people to let them know that. Uh, but we have as uh, you know, Aaron, a vast array of housing configurations on the campus, ranging from some dormitory style that, that are quite old to some dormitory style that are quite new, um, and then apartment style and suite style and all kinds of different configurations. So uh, the, 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 the real challenges associated with uh, housing um, are gonna um, still ultimately come down to uh, the individual um, and the protocols that we are going to be endorsing for individuals as they manage the space within which they're living and more broadly the hall within which they're living. Uh, some of our, um, our housing lends itself really, really well to self-contained en suite and some of it does not. Um, and so uh, we'll just want to be very, very communicative with people about our plans. Um, what I will say is that uh, we, we have had good experience uh, with the population that we were housing this spring um, in terms of, of their self-management and the, and the impact of that. Um, people were, were very responsible um, and uh, admittedly with lower density, um, you have greater flexibility and opportunity, um, but uh, this is one of the areas that we've been consulting closely with our regional health district medical doctor. Um, and we will um, be, be very much focused on housing as a fundamental component of our planning um, as we go forward. Uh, a lot of what, what all of our plans revolve around is the awareness uh, that we can do extraordinary work in one area only to find that by virtue of uh, people moving on and off the campus, uh, they're, they're um, moving into different spaces and circles. And so an awful lot of what our, the advice we're getting and the, um, the development of the expectations that we're creating um, really begin with the individual and with the individual's own management of their uh, personal space and their own health. Um, and that's so that uh, the, um, if you will, the, the protocol uh, that they're adopting for self-management is, is the one thing that's movable throughout the community and the campus, wherever they may be. They're moving into a classroom or a dining environment or a housing environment or, or a library environment. Um, some of the same practices that we're going to be encouraging in every one of those environments are the ones that um, we believe will best serve them uh, and best serve 
uh, them in relationship to others who hopefully are practicing uh, those same uh, disciplines. So uh, we'll, pardon me, we will, we will continue, uh, you know, to uh, be very, very clear um, and, and very disclosive about what the um, situation is going to be and how we are going to be asking people to, to work with us to manage it. Thank you. There are some questions that are along the theme of um, how are we going to keep students safe? So are we going to have PPE for students and faculty and staff? Are we testing students? Maybe if you could touch on the health center and some of the plans around that. Let me make sure I, I got all the ones related to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, so um, you know, the, the, there's, there's certain key uh, sort of self-management and, and um, uh, public health management strategies that are currently being endorsed. Um, uh, masking is essential. Uh, and for, from my perspective, this is going to be a both and. Uh, we, we ask our community members uh, to bring certain things with them from home, uh, our students from, from their, you know, home of record or residence, uh, ordinarily on a, on a regular annual basis. Uh, masks and some forms of PPE may be part of what it is that we ask them to bring with them, as well as uh, that which we will provide or supply. Um, there's clear evidence that two individuals, even in relatively close proximity, who are both wearing masks, dramatically reduces the incidence of transmission. Um, it, it, it is um, clear that masks are gonna be an element. Um, hand washing uh, is something that, at the beginning of this whole thing was a really big deal. It was like, everybody was talking about washing your hands. You notice people aren't talking about washing hands as much as they used to. It's as important as it ever was. In fact, it is a first line of defense, even in medical facilities. Uh, cleanliness is, is going to be emphasized and opportunities for people to have access to antibacterial wipes and so forth is going to be prevalent on the campus. Um, the, the, the third is social distancing itself. Um, we are talking about mapping out spaces, uh, including what ordinarily is high density dining, um, clearing the ballroom of the Hemmingson Center and adding it to the inventory for, for campus dining in order to facilitate social distancing. Um, the, even the way that food service itself is provided is going to have many more options across the campus, a lot of which are, are kind of take and, and go kinds of options as well as dine-in options. Uh, again, increased flexibility, uh, lower density uh, is the goal uh, for social distancing. And um, that's, gonna, that's gonna affect an array of issues ranging from classes and number of class sections that we hold and the kind of flexibility that has to be imagined in that um, to, you know, the, the kinds of activities that we sponsor on the campus. The fourth is the protocol related to testing. Um, and we're working very closely. Gonzaga has its own health center. We, we operate our own facility staffed by a director and doctors, psychiatrists, together with the broader mental health group, our counseling center, um, psychiatrists and, and counselors. Uh, and so uh, we have a very robust apparatus of our own on the campus that works very, very closely with our medical community here in Spokane. And for those who don't know Spokane well, we have not one, but two major medical systems here in the central part of the city. Uh, that serve a very large geographic area of the region. It's the largest medical center between Seattle and Minneapolis. 
um, and it has great um, doctors, a great medical community, doctors, nurses, PAs, and so forth, upon whom we rely and with whom we're in communication constantly to support the many medical needs of our students. Uh, so uh, our, med our medical, our health center has actually been able to test for COVID-19 for longer uh, than um, has been available at, at many other places. But we're looking at what the expansion of testing and both in terms of testing for the virus as well as uh, testing you know, for the antibodies um, and having rapid results uh, would um, allow us to do on the campus would be dramatic. Uh, we were talking today about the fact that with adequate testing um, and near immediate response, it can have a profound effect on how long an individual might be required to, to quarantine. Everybody's heard about 14 days. Now we're talking about 48 hours. Uh, it, it, it dramatically changes uh, what it is that people are obligated to do safely to kind of self-manage. But on that score, I wanna mention that this too relates to housing because we have been developing our plans for the availability of locations on and adjacent to campus that can be used for quarantine and isolation in the event uh, that, that we do have an infection or a set of, a cluster of infections. And, and that possibility is something that we understand, we accept, and we feel we have an obligation to manage too. So um, those, those, uh, those four elements that are sort of the core of the public health response until we can get to the point of a vaccine uh, you know, are, are going to be kind of the standing protocols for us as a community going forward um, for some time. Thank you. And you were just mentioning quarantine and there was a question about that. Will students be required to quarantine coming onto campus for fall semester depending on where they're coming from? Um, that's a great question that I cannot um, specifically answer at this point. Um, there are um, a lot of, of questions that relate to, this is what we would love to be able to see happen theoretically. Uh, the question really awaits the answer of, are there gonna be uh, an adequate number of available tests with rapid results uh, that will allow us to, um, to establish a baseline across a wide swath of the population or not, uh, because it's really in the absence of the availability of testing that quarantine becomes a much more significant operative protocol. Uh, if you have tests and you can rule out the possibility that somebody has it, um, that allows you to do um, dramatically different things. So we have had some discussion about whether or not there is merit to the idea of inviting students back earlier to uh, self-quarantine, um, but that immediately gets us into a whole set of issues that relate to um, right to privacy, uh, uh, ability to support uh, large numbers of people quarantining, um, and, and sort of uh, really the question of how static versus dynamic our population truly is. So that's not to say that we, we have an answer, that's just to say, we're very well aware of the problem safe space, and we've got a team of people who are specifically focused on that as one of the kind of major questions that we have to answer. Thank you. And I know we're close to five, but there are like three more main topics to cover. If we can go just a little bit over, if that's okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one of the big ones is just how you envision, with physical distance being necessary, how do you envision some of the larger classes like band or chorus? Um, will that affect someone's ability to get done on time in, towards graduation? And then also how do you envision like traditional activities of students coming together in community and you know, having that college experience with physical dif distance? Yeah, well, this is a, an issue we were um, listening to uh, 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 
President John Jenkins of Notre Dame today, who's been on television quite a lot because Notre Dame today announced that they were going to uh, proceed with returning uh, to campus in the fall and that inclusive of face-to-face -face instruction. Um, and I think, it, I think it's important uh, that we understand and that we um, not uh, be unrealistic uh, about those dimensions or aspects of uh, what coming together and being members of a community uh, in, in, the, in the sense that a college brings people together is, is about um, and um, be very upfront and direct about the fact that uh, we will do everything that we can uh, in those places and spaces that we manage and are responsible for um, for creating uh, the context uh, that is um, going to facilitate uh, the, the, the maximum amount of uh, protection for our students and faculty. Uh, and we're going to uh, be very, very uh, uh, directive with people about what it is that we need them to do in order to remain safe and in order to work to keep other people safe. Uh, the um, work that we're doing right now and have actually accomplished a great deal of um, has us mapping out things like seating patterns in classrooms and, and driving the question of how many people can be in a given space at a given time and then what in turn uh, does that set up for, uh, you know, for the class itself, uh, the, the size of a section uh, that we can support um, and the ways in which we continue to keep everybody on track towards the achievement of the academic program um, while at the same time remaining vigilant about adhering to practices that we hope will really maximize their chance for doing that safely and health, healthfully. Um, and that um, immediately tees up um, compromises. Uh, so for example, um, we may have a situation where there's a faculty member who uh, is not feeling well on a particular day, but they feel um, capable of continuing to, to teach the class, um, but they're sensitive and they're concerned about, even if it's a seasonal flu, uh, what that might do in terms of exposure to, to students. So they might choose or elect to um, conduct the class from a remote location. Um, and the students, again, with social distancing and all the, the contemporary protocols in place are, are together, but they're participating with that faculty member um, live and, and via, via webcam. Um, there's all kinds of different possibilities around how we continue to facilitate effective learning that demand that we're creative um, and that we're flexible uh, because we have to be kind of prepared for, you know, any possible, uh, possibility or circumstance. But we've been in touch with some facilities that are close to campus, but not immediately on the campus that might be available um, that would help to expand our capacity for certain types of courses. Um, and so uh, band and, and chorus and, and other kinds of um, large group uh, situations are ones that are definitely on our list. Um, we have to be able to respond effectively um, to, the, to the very real health concerns while at the same time uh, managing the, the, the need to uh, continue to progress forward. Um, I, I just think that we also have to be um, very realistic about the fact that uh, we're going to be depending upon students uh, to be a huge part of the equation of helping us to keep uh, the educational program intact and safe. I mean, I, I, I want our students to feel that they can have the full benefit of the experience of being with one another um, and that we know that a big part of college life is the social aspect of it. Um, that's just part of this reality. And it's something that, that all students have been thirsty for 
ever since everybody was obligated to stay at home and to try to do this work via Zoom and et cetera. Um, but that still can be done uh, in ways that minimize the chance for transmission of the virus, particularly with our aid and assistance. But that aid and assistance doesn't take the place of individuals um, being responsible and recognizing that they have agency and that we're going to be asking them both for themselves, for their, you know, their peers and their fellow students, but also for the long goal of, of keeping Gonzaga University and our ability to do this work alive and active and healthy and intact um, as a community uh, commitment. And so um, we're gonna be very upfront with people, very realistic with people um, and, and acknowledge and recognize that, that everybody has to come to this recognizing that they wanna be a part of it and that they can play an important role in helping it to be successful. Forgot that I muted myself. <laughs> you um, queued up a next question, which is uh, you were talking about, you know, maybe a professor doesn't feel well and is going to deliver a class um, in a digital way or something like that. There are a lot of questions about what if we have to go online in the fall? If mm -hmm. that were to happen, um, what happens with tuition? On the flip side, before this webinar, some people submitted questions and some were asking, if I want to stay home for the first semester, can I take my classes online? So if mm -hmm. you could address the online questions, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, so where, where I would start, because uh, we as a community have had quite a bit of conversation about this. Um, it, it is with an assertion, and that is to say that uh, the mode of delivery uh, should not, and in our view, does not change the value of what it is that we are trying to accomplish through the educational program. It does, however, and I say this as one who loves Gonzaga and has loved everything about what we try to create in terms of the on-campus experience. Uh, being completely online uh, does affect uh, an important dimension or aspect of what it is that we believe that we do well and what it is that we believe um, is an important part of the experience. There's so much that happens uh, for a Gonzaga student uh, that is part of their co-curricular experience. Um, it's educationally relevant. Uh, there are, are so many experiences that we invite our students to be a part of uh, that um, look and feel and ultimately land on people differently when they're not able to do uh, those things um, in relationship, physical uh, relationship and community relationship with others. So um, if we were compelled to be completely online, uh, which we know some institutions have, have chosen to do, um, I believe that we would be obligated to examine what it is that our cost structure um, would be in that circumstance and what it is that that would um, uh, have as an impact, if you will, on what it is that we would ask people to pay uh, for this experience. Um, the, the academic component of the experience itself, however, um, it, it is really important to underscore, and I say this simply because this has been our, our lived experience at Gonzaga. Um, the amount of, of effort and the amount of time and, and the amount of um, hours uh, that delivering courses uh, to our students via distance technologies um, has required in order to do it well um, has been uh, incredible. It has been an immense commitment of time and energy on the part of our faculty and on the part of those supporting our faculty. 
And while it has restricted certain types of activities that otherwise might have been done a different way, uh, the amount of creativity and ingenuity that has gone into developing analogs uh, in virtual space, even for experiments that are done in labs, for example, has meant that um, the, the workload associated with providing uh, the educational program via that modality has in some cases been four times, five times, literally uh, as great as it might otherwise have been. Uh, and that is because uh, every aspect of doing this work in, in a fundamentally different mode demands a complete re-architecting and an imagination of how it's going to be experienced by the students on the other end, how the facilitation of interaction is going to have to occur. Because our faculty take this extremely seriously and they understand that merely because a student isn't with them in the classroom does not uh, in any way alleviate them of the obligation for ensuring that that student remains engaged, is getting what they need, um, has the opportunity to uh, do the kind of work that will demonstrate that they've mastered the material and so forth. And so um, our faculty uh, would, would much prefer doing this work in person, not because it would be, uh, 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 you know, less work, uh, but because the monumental amount of effort required to do both, which is to be prepared for both eventualities, um, is, is really hard to describe. And our faculty, I would say further, because I think this is an important part of it too, um, many of them really were um, concerned about our students and uh, opened up additional opportunity outside of the course environment for students to be in contact, to receive academic advising, to receive personal support. Um, and many, many of our students in turn, um, many of our students in turn uh, responded uh, by, by requesting and asking for that support because they love the interactions with their faculty um, and they really needed that support. So I, I just share that because I think it's very important to say that when we are compelled to uh, deliver a course on, online um, and we do that conventionally and traditionally for certain of our grad programs already, uh, an immense amount of work goes into doing that well. Um, and this transition that occurred this spring was not really a transition from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online as much as it was figuring out how to continue to teach in the face of a disaster. Um, so um, our faculty put their heart and soul into that project. Um, we, we have to be prepared for whatever comes. Um, and we're going to be working throughout the summer, all of us to uh, be prepared to do whatever it takes because our returning students, they have to graduate and we are determined to continue the work that we need to in whatever mode we need to continue it in to satisfy them and to ensure that they're supported all the way through. Um, but uh, this, this uh, broader issue of the full comprehensive experience of what it's like to live and fully participate in campus life, student government, um, opportunities for ministry. Uh, these, these are really important aspects um, and being unable to do much of that work would, would, would compel us to re-examine that question. Um, we're, we're a place that believes in being fair uh, to the extent that we can project what it is that we're gonna be doing. We, we'll do that and, and we wanna tell people upfront this is what we think, this is, this is what we believe we can do and, and allow people to be fully informed and make an, you know, a well-informed decision, uh, including uh, knowing upfront to the extent we can possibly identify it, what the cost impact issues would be.
did it again. Um, lovely question. We appreciate the time and energy you're taking and preparing for ever-changing circumstances. How can we as parents be of help and how can we best encourage and lead our incoming freshmen to also look for ways to jump in and be helpful? Hmm. Yeah, that's really super cool to be honest with you because um, this, this, the, the whole reason that um, I fell in love with Gonzaga and that I remain so um, invested in who we are as a community is because we have, <laughs> we have awesome students. Um, our, our students are, um, they're just incredibly bright and talented and generous people. And um, they show that every day and they, and they do that in so many different ways, whether they're here on campus or all the way on the other side of the world. And um, so uh, I am really grateful uh, for the question. And all I would say is, um, I think what we seek is uh, the fullest possible awareness on everybody's part of what it is that this whole situation kind of represents. So at, at its core, uh, we, we, are, we, are not, uh, we are not in a situation other than, than this. Uh, we believe so strongly in the impact of what a university education can do for people. And if I can say this specifically, what a Gonzaga education can do, uh, that we're bound and determined to the fullest extent that we are able to and permitted to, uh, to create the opportunity for that, for as many students as wish to take advantage of it and will benefit from it. We happen to be doing that at this particular point in time in the context of a pandemic. Um, and it is a wicked, very randomly uh, af effective pandemic in the sense that uh, I have not yet uh, shared with, with our community, uh, which I would be compelled to under federal law, that we have an identified case of COVID-19 on the campus because we have not had a single one. Um, that cannot be said for institutions within 40 miles uh, of Gonzaga, although within 40 miles of Gonzaga, the numbers are extremely small. Um, so even in our region, the incidence rate is nothing like it's been in other parts of the country. And that's both to say that there's random chance at work, and also we know that there's been um, horrific loss. And we're very, very conscious and aware of that. And we're very concerned about trying to do everything we can to mitigate uh, incidents for our community. We feel that's our highest priority. Um, so we have this, you know, intrinsically tension filled situation where we want to do so badly this work that allows our students to be successful on their continued journey and capitalizes on the tremendous investment that, that you as students and families have made to date in this whole process. And we're doing that in this very weird and, and in some cases highly um, challenging context. But we believe we should try. Um, being successful in large part is gonna be dependent on people saying, we understand that that's our situation and we're willing to be active participants in helping to manage this. Um, if we've got people who come and just say, well, you know, there isn't a problem and we don't know, you know, what you're talking about and et cetera, then we're all at much higher risk for, you know, that random chance converting. And we're very aware of that. So we're going we're gonna to try to do our best to be very clear about expectations and frankly, consequences, because there's a lot at stake here um, well beyond the virus. We, we believe the future of our professions, uh, the future of our society is dependent upon 
well-educated people who can make real contributions. And our alumni are doing that all over the world right now. Um, and, they're, and they're telling us, you know, let's go for it. Let's, let's figure out how to make this work because we need more Zags and we need more well-educated people to help solve all these problems that are, that are gonna be with us, COVID related and not. So I really appreciate the question because it's a question that is filled with the kind of hope that is really at the core of our whole mission. Our mission is about a hope filled future. And um, we, will, we will help answer that question along the way by providing you with specific information um, but uh, we also want you to know we have no corner on wisdom in this situation. Any questions, ideas, advice, thoughts that you may have, uh, we, we, we would invite those. We would want to know those uh, because it helps us do our best thinking. And it's always been the case that Gonzaga families, as well as the student who is at the core of this relationship, have been a huge part of making our university a success. So I thank you for that question. Thank you so much. There have been a couple questions about you know, how to prepare for the fall. And um, I just want everyone to know we will have continued um, communication with all of you, preparing for the upcoming semester with students, with families. Um, I know the first year experience program is going to have a how to zag webinar on June 6. So hang in there with us. We will do continued communication through the summer um, to help you get prepared for what's coming. I know there's a question about an international student wanting to know how early to arrive and things like that. And we will definitely be in touch about that. Um, one last question, and that is just sports. Are we going to have athletics? How does the kennel look? <laughs> Go Zags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so uh, I, <laughs> this is helpful in some ways and not helpful in other ways in, in, into the response. But I will tell you that, as, as you might imagine, um, we've got our own group of people who are very invested uh, they are, they're beginning, the core of their work has actually been focused on the student athletes and um, how do you facilitate a safe environment for training uh, and for competition, uh, looking specifically at the question of, of student athletes and their welfare. Um, and that, that's, that's who we are anyway, but that, that's a core principle that's at the heart of collegiate athletics. And um, along comes a now uh, new guidance, uh, which will very much be a part of informing our institutional response to your question. And that is that as a member of the NCAA, we are obligated uh, to uh, pay close attention to the guidance that they are giving us. So it was the NCAA that directed the athletic conferences uh, to cease competition midway through the basketball championship uh, cycle for conferences. It was the NCAA that canceled uh, spring sports. Um, as a member, we're obligated to follow their lead. It is of course far easier to close things down and cancel things than it is to say, and this is how we will restart things. Um, so that's, that's a truth, particularly in the face of a situation where you really don't have a solution. All of your strategies are about mitigation and avoidance. Um, but I, I, I will say that, you know, as you can imagine at a place like Gonzaga, athletics are really, really important, both uh, the division one uh, sports as well as intramurals and and um, you know uh, club sports, and so uh, we're working across an array of um, of thinking about how we how we manage with that. Sports is actually 
a very important part of the uh, student experience. Um, inter intramurals and club sports are, are a big part of many students' experience. So they're gonna wanna know answers to those questions too. And uh, we, we, we are going to continue, because um, this, this guidance is coming constantly now, uh, to pay attention to and to try to bring the best thinking that we possibly can um, I think where most people have the greatest concern is about, you know, how do we safely manage uh, the environment of the basketball arena? Because it's a closed arena environment. And, and as many of you may have seen now, there are simulations that are available. If you really want to, you know, um, get immersed in this around, you know, uh, uh, um, basically, it's, it's all issues related to viral loading. And so we, we're going we're gonna to have to really examine these issues carefully. We, we are looking at the technical capabilities of our spaces because our HVAC systems and our filtration systems, you know, play a role in um, doing some modeling around risk assessment. Um, we're going to be really prudent, though. And our concern is, you know, um, how do we keep our students safe um, and at the same time balance, you know, student athlete safety and coach safety and all that with the opportunity for people, you know, to um, be spectators and active and enjoy the opportunity of, of watching their fellow students compete. So we'll keep working on it, but it's a big area. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying a little longer, Dr. McCullough. Thank you, all you future Zags and family members for participating today. Thank you for your wonderful questions. If you have further questions, please contact us anytime. The easiest email to remember is admissions at gonzaga.edu. We will always chase down the information that you need. And um, also this was recorded, this webinar. We will post it online tomorrow. And we will also send out um, emails to all admitted and enrolling students so they know how to access it later. Um, but thank you, Dr. McCullough, and thank you, Future Zags. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today.